There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. There is now no condemnation. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit instructed Paul to write that verse, especially after going through the first seven chapters where every one of us felt so condemned. This made us feel so horrible, wretched sinners that we are. And he says, but there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. But what he was telling us, if you remember in chapter seven, was this is the struggle of the, of the Christian life. The struggle of the Christian life is, is trying to put this old nature to rest. Uh, that is our struggle. And so he introduced us to the two spiritual laws, the one law that was always there of the old nature, the old Adam nature, that flesh that is constantly trying to get us to violate God's laws and we're not going to kill that thing. Well, the thing is dead and we've got to reckon it dead, but there is that ghost, I use that term, the ghost of the old man that keeps bothering us, haunting us, hounding us, and trying to get us to believe that all we, ha all we are, are are just simply prisoners to the old nature. And that's just not true anymore. And so there's the new law of the spirit that says that when you're in the spirit, that old life is now done away with and we can now live in this new life in the spirit of God. And, and that's the, the good news of the gospel. And so here is the struggle that is introduced in chapter seven and that's why he can say, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. None of us are condemned because God knows how the rules are played. He understands where it all is. He understands where we are. And so he's not going to condemn us for trying to live by the Spirit, knowing that there is this ghost that haunts us, constantly trying to get us to violate the spiritual, the spiritual law. And so this battle, and I mentioned that is the spiritual battle for the Christian. We often get caught up in spiritual warfare. Christians do. It's, it's, it's a distraction and we start chasing demons everywhere. But the reality is the greatest battle we face is within ourselves. And it's not demonic, it's the old man versus the new man. And that's where we really need to spend most of our time battling or fighting, if you will. And Paul talks a little bit more about that in verse or chapter eight. But what he's saying is now, chin up, chin up. There's no condemnation for you any longer in Christ. And the, the good news here also, taking all that we've learned up to this very verse is, you're not gonna be perfect. So not only chin up, but chill out, as you're not gonna be perfect. And uh, we have the grace of the Lord that is going to cover us. This is all that he's talking about. Now, we went through the whole argument. Does that mean we should continue to sin so that grace may abound? No, 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 that's, you missed the whole point. That's not it. We should continue to try not to sin, but the reality is, is we're going to sin, but there's no condemnation for those of us who do. And all of us will, by the way. And so we're all needing to hear this encouraging word, that there is therefore, and that word therefore, remember, always connects us to what came before it. And so considering all this, and especially for chapter six and seven, there is now no condemnation. So, so get that into your head. Realize this. For those who are in Christ, no condemnation. And that is the secret. And the whole chapter is going to really elaborate more on that. Being in Christ. Very important phrase. Being in Christ in our terms just simply means you're a born again Christian. You are living in the Lord. The Lord is living in you. That identity with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. And if you are truly in Christ, there's no condemnation against you. Now, Jesus said, if you're not in Christ, meaning in John chapter three, he said, if you do not believe, you're condemned already. So there is condemnation to those who are not in Christ. And don't apologize for that. It's a terrible situation. But we were all condemned. Jesus came to save the condemned. And so all one needs to do to be saved is to believe. It's, he made it as simple and clear as possible. And those who refuse to believe, well, well, then you continue along that path of condemnation. And there's nothing he can do to stop it if you will not believe. 
And so when we see this, we realize that this salvation is available to all. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And uh, we have to believe that. And, and we don't want to um, uh, apologize for talking about heaven and hell. It, it's a real thing. It's a real place. In fact, hell should be a real motivator for Christians to talk to people about the love of God and how he has forgiven them. And so there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Our job, the Great Commission, is to get as many people into Christ as possible along the way. That's our commission, our mission, to get people into Jesus Christ. Now, the last half of verse 1, who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit, many argue with very good, strong arguments that the verse or that part of the verse doesn't really belong to verse 1. There's a couple reasons for that, because it does seem to give an out. In other words, it sounds almost as if it's talking about the way you walk rather than the way you believe. In other words, if you read it, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So it almost sounds like it's saying there's no condemnation so long as you're living right. But if you're not living right, well, you know, no promises there. Right? So some think that, that there was a translator that was translating Paul's words and actually wanted to help him out a bit. That's really what some people believe, to strengthen this point just a bit more because he didn't make it strong enough. Some people are really afraid of trusting God with grace. They're afraid to do that because you know, God could, could give out so much grace that people could take advantage of it. And that would be terrible. And so they want to make sure they could put limits around God's grace. I'm glad that grace can tear down those limits and blow them away. I'm not afraid of grace. I'm not afraid of it at all. And honestly, I do not believe this verse needs to be there, that half of the verse. And the reason is because it's in verse 4, exact wording. It's already there, just not right after that wonderful good news that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ, even if you're not walking correctly. That doesn't mean there's not punishment, correction, discipline. All of those things are real. And they're part of God's loving hand upon your life. There will be those things for misbehavior because he loves us. And the scripture makes that clear as well. Condemnation is a whole different thing. It means hell. You're, you have no reason to fear hell because Jesus has saved you. And so that's good news. And now he goes on in talking about the walk of the Christian for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so I'm free. This is a new, new rules now. I'm free. I'm free from the law of the old man. I'm free from the power of sin. And so I can approach the Christian life in a whole different way. I can approach life freely with, with joy rather than with, with fear or pressure to perform. And he's going to explain why that's important. We can't perform up to God's standards anyway. And so we behave like children. And, or we, we approach God much like children. Even Jesus said you must be as children. And the idea that he's making here with this idea of grace, it's like a little kid that's learning to color. You give him a, 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 a cartoon and you say, here, color this picture and try to stay inside the lines. Well, you know when a kid's learning to color, staying inside the lines is almost impossible because he doesn't have the motor skills for that yet. It's impossible for him to do so. And so he colors all over the place and you say, oh, isn't that great? You know it's not great, it's terrible. But you say it's great and because you know you're not going to whack your kid for not coloring in the lines. He can't do it, you know he can't do it. And so you're, you're not upset with him. God does the same with us. He knows we can't do it. He expects that we're going to be outside the lines quite often, but he knows that this is just out, way above our, our ability to perform. And so uh, he goes on and he says, now we're under these new rules. Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death for what the law could not do in that it was weak 
through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on the account of sin, on account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, what, what this is saying, basically, if I could put it in a nutshell, when the law was delivered, it told us what was right, but it did not provide the might. It does not give us power to perform that which is right. And so that's what he's saying, the flesh was weak. The flesh was too weak to, to perform the good law of God. We, we were unable to do it, or we couldn't color within the lines. And since we violated the lines, well now we have to approach God in a different way, and the only way to do that is to approach God in Christ. We come to God in Christ, Jesus has kept us within the lines in a sense. He's colored us within the lines. Now we can go to God because we are in Christ. And that's the only way we can approach God. That's why he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And so he has condemned sin. He's, he's condemned sin and not you. He's condemned your sin and my sin. And, and now we can come to God and he says in verse 4 that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us. Very important wording here. This, that the law was fulfilled in us because we are in Christ. And it cannot be fulfilled by us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's our, that's our delight now. That's, that's our challenge is to walk in obedience to the Spirit of God as opposed to what we used to do. The only option we had was to walk in obedience to the flesh. The flesh would say, go sin, we would go sin. The flesh would say, disobey God, we would disobey God. Now the flesh is still telling us those things, but the difference is the Spirit says, you don't have to do that. There's a new sheriff in town. You don't have, you don't have to listen to that. We have, we have new rules now. You can obey me, the Spirit would say, you can follow my ways, and you don't have to follow uh, the old ways any longer. And so, again, if you think about it, if he's talking about walking according to something, he's talking about the way we live our life. This is how we live. And so we live now no longer according to the old nature. We live according to the new nature, the spirit life. In verse 5, for those who live, there's that word. He could have said for those who walk. But in this particular case, he changed the word, which gives us permission to do the same thing. To walk, to live are the same thing. So he's saying, for those who live according to the flesh, and here's the secret, those who live according to the flesh are living that way because, he says, they have set their minds on the things of the flesh. Do you see this? So we're not living according to the flesh because we... we uh, necessarily have to we live according to the flesh because our minds are fleshly and they're thinking fleshly things they're the things that that inspire us they're the things that motivate us those things that are constantly luring us tempting us forming opinions in us it's usually in our mind that's usually the battleground the battlefield where spiritual warfare is fought that's where the warfare between the old nature and the new nature is fought. Don't be mistaken in thinking that it's something I feel inside. No, no, no. That's the ignorant Christian who talks like that. That's ignorance, really. It's spiritual ignorance. It's the mind, the mind. And you have to apply the mind. Peter, remember, said, gird up the loins of your mind. And it's so we, we start battling right and wrong truth and error with doctrine with scripture with spiritual thought as opposed to fleshly thought and notice how he develops this for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit this is how the spiritual life is supposed to be lived it is not natural we don't live the spiritual life naturally, though as you become adept at it, as you become skilled in the spiritual life, if I can use that wording, it feels so natural because your mind is now on spiritual things. 
Paul in Colossians chapter three said, now that you've been raised with Christ, set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth. In Philippians, Paul said, think on these things and the peace of God will rule your hearts and minds. So it's a process, it's more than a process, it's a practice, it's a de developing a discipline in how we think. If you're struggling with fleshly things, chances are you're thinking a lot about them. So you have to exchange those thoughts with correct thoughts or better thoughts is a better way of putting it. Better thoughts. So often what we do is we start saying, don't think on it, don't think on it, don't think on it, don't think on it. And all you do is think on it by trying not to think on it. And so you, you, in a sense, you have to just put it aside and say, turn up the Christian radio station. If it weren't broken, you could probably turn on ours. <laughs> and, and you would be able to listen to it. Or you could go to the internet and listen to it there. But you would be able to listen to, you listen to Christian things. Listen, we live in the age of technology. There's absolutely no excuse for not growing in the word of God today. No excuse except laziness and fleshly thinking. That's the only thing you can, you can attribute it to. And fortunately, I'm speaking to the choir because you're all here tonight where you should be. Meaning you're growing spiritually in your thoughts, in your mind by, by hearing Bible words, Bible teaching, Christian worship, Christian music. This stuff feeds you spiritually. And the more you put into you, the more you're going to lean on when those fleshly thoughts start knocking at, at the door of your brain. And so you gotta keep those thoughts out of your focus by focusing on spiritual things. And you just start meditating on the Lord. It's, Christian meditation is, is a real thing. But Christian meditation is not sitting in a corner with your arms crossed, touching your index finger to your thumb. That's, that's something else, that's something uh, kooky. But what you do, is you sit on your front porch with a cup of coffee and think about God or read the Bible or take a walk in the woods and, and smile at the birds as you realize God made every one of them and knows what they're doing and feeds them whenever he wants to. And what am I worried about? If he's feeding those birds, what do I have to worry about? And this is how we, we commune with God, meditate on the Lord everywhere, every day, at any moment, all the time. And that's how we control the thoughts of our minds because those thoughts are going to constantly attack you. They will always threaten your peace. And that's fleshly thinking. And when you start behaving in the flesh, it's because you've dwelled, dwelt a little too deeply on the wrong thoughts. And so you wanna control all of it. And you know, have you ever had those arguments with that person who isn't even in the room? and you repeat it over and I'm gonna tell them this and I'm gonna tell them that and I'm gonna say this and you start eating and you start fuming and the next thing you see that person, lo and behold, you pretty much said most of the stuff you said you were gonna say. And you thought, and you walk away and you think, oh, why did I do that? Well, you just spent the last three days thinking about it. What did you think was going to happen? Instead, Jesus said you pray for your enemies. You pray for those who offend you. Pray for those that persecute you. What is that? It's spiritually controlling your thoughts so that you're unable to think the worst about those people. You're able to think the best of them. Now, what does that require? But spiritual discipline, training. It doesn't come naturally. It's, it's supernatural work and it's sweat. Yes, it's, it's right. It, it's Christian sweat. That's how we sweat. We we force ourselves to do the right thing, think the right thing. And I'm telling you, this, this verse is, we could really do a series on the mind, uh, and it could be several weeks, and probably some of you are going, yeah, yeah, let's do that. I could really use that right now. <laughs> I would, but I can't focus on it that long. But uh, those who live according to the flesh are living that way because you're thinking fleshly. How simple is that? It's so simple. And if you happen to be living spiritually, 
It's because you've trained your mind to be spiritual. And that's really what it's all about. That is Christian, your battlefield. Don't make a mistake in thinking the devil is in this. This is so personal. This is about you and you. <laughs> it's you and you, you're fighting yourself. And so you wanna get control of that and you'll find great victory. In fact, that's where victory is. In verse six, he says, for to be carnally minded, carnally is another way of saying fleshly. Same concept. To be fleshly minded, to be carnally minded, you can add worldly minded, it's all connected, though they are different, but it's all connected. For to be carnally minded is death. I like Paul. He, he, he's not politically correct about anything. And, and nor should you be Christians. You might work on being nice, but you don't have to be politically correct. We don't care about politics. We care about being right with God, and if you don't, then you're carnal thinking. You need to be right with God. And Paul is just simply saying this quite clearly. If you're gonna think like the flesh, that's leading to death. There's nowhere else you're going to end up but spiritually dead. And that's what he's talking about. He's not talking about physical death, but there's a spiritual death that awaits you if you allow your mind to constantly, constantly track over the same fleshly behavior. And he said, uh, to be carnally minded is death. Spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, hey, well, that's what we're looking for. The only way to find that is by training your mind to be spiritual. Notice the wording, spiritually minded. It's not spiritual acting, it's spiritual mindedness. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You have to think a certain way before you can behave a certain way. And so you learn these things in your spiritual mind, which is the mind of Christ that is constantly, we're constantly being trained in. And it's coming out in the way we behave. Because he says in verse seven, the carnal mind the fleshly mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Notice this, nor indeed can be. Don't try to convert your flesh. It can never happen. It will always be at odds with God. That's what enmity means. It, it's striving with God perpetually. It will never change. So we have chapters six and seven that says just reckon it dead. It's dead. Don't try to convert it. Don't preach to it. Don't try and reason with it. Don't try to appease it. Maybe if I give in a little bit, maybe he'll give me some peace over here. No, no. All that does is feed it and make it stronger. So don't, don't barter with it. Kill it. Don't listen to it. Because that will all, the carnal mind is enmity. Meaning, it doesn't just lean that way. It is that. It is that and will never change. And so you have to recognize the enemy within. The enemy within is the flesh. And it has to be reckoned dead. And then we have to build up the spiritual mind so that we don't even hear the flesh mind as much as it wants to be heard. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. It does not plan to obey God's law at all, and never will be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Whew. You see it? I'd rather be in Christ, right? That's where you want to be. You want to be in Christ. You want to be in the Spirit, because that's where I'm able to please the Lord. That's what we want to do in this life that we live. We want to live a way that is pleasing to the Lord. But if you plan on staying in the flesh, well, you're never going to be able to please the Lord. You cannot, it says. Cannot happen. And yet we try to convince ourselves that we can be in the flesh and be spiritual on Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever, and we think we're going to come in and we're going to impress God, like somehow he doesn't know the truth about us. He knows the truth. And so there's no way that we can 
please the Lord if we're feeding our flesh and living in our flesh. But he says, again, he's giving us this wake-up call. You're not in the flesh. You're in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. And you're, if you're a Christian, really a Christian, then you shouldn't be listening to your flesh. This is what he's talking about. You shouldn't be. There is this, this necessity for growth. You have to grow up now. You know, I think I mentioned this last week. You know, you got the bad temper, or you got the vulgar mouth, you got the, you know, the lingering pot habit or drug habit or whatever it may be. Quit it. It's the flesh. Stop giving into it. Stop making excuses and justifying it. It's the flesh. Call it the flesh and, and put it to rest and start determining that you're going to outgrow it and you're not going to do it. Instead of saying, I, I'll, ne I'll never give up that habit. I just can't get. Yeah, you can. You can and you must. That's the idea. No excuses for your bad behavior. It has to be dealt with spiritually. And, and I say this to you, but I'm saying it to me too. I've got one or two bad habits myself. One or two, maybe not many more, but I've got a few bad habits. My wife, on the other hand, she's got a lot of bad habits, and I'm working on those too, believe me. <laughs> Which is a real bad habit of mine. But <laughs> um, that is the problem. You know, I, I, it is, I said this to someone uh, not too long ago. It's really funny how terrible our sin looks when someone else is wearing it, isn't it? I mean, we, we have no tolerance for someone who's doing the exact same things we're doing. But for us, we have a different, we call it something else when we're doing it. It's just different. It's just different for me. But it's not. That's an excuse. And that's fleshly thinking. And we don't please the Lord when we dodge those bullets. We can't do that. We, we need to be able to open ourselves up to the Lord in the light of the Lord and say, Lord, expose me. Expose me. Privately. <laughs> I don't, listen, I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't, I, I'm like you. I don't want to be embarrassed. And when the Lord's dealing with me, I want to be able to say, amen, Lord, I see it. Now, fix it. I can't fix it. I've tried. But if you, I recognize it, I confess it, now please fix it. And humbly, you can go to the Lord and he'll fix it. And he doesn't need to embarrass you. But embarrassment may be the course of action if you won't repent. All you have to do is ask the preachers who've been called to the carpet for, for illicit lifestyles, wrong lifestyles. And it's been broadcast in the news. We have one recently in our own family, and it hurts. And there is no way, no way that any of us, at least pastors, there's no way any of us think that that suddenly happened. We know there were warnings. We know that there, was, there, was the, there were those opportunities when God said, if you don't, I will. You'd better repent or I will. And that comes to every one of our lives. That's God's love. That's not vengeance. That's nothing but God's love. I love you so much, I will embarrass you so you get to see it. I love you so much. I want this sin away from you so badly. I'll do whatever it takes. And I don't care if you're embarrassed in the process. Because he cares more about your spirituality, about your eternal life, about your spiritual fruit that he's willing to prune all the way down to the vine if he must to get the fruit that he's looking for in your life. And that it's painful, I know. So... If you want to be fruitful, then let the Lord have his way. Open it up. Open up your life. And here he says, we are not in the flesh. You are not a fleshly person. You're spiritual now. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Notice, it's God's spirit in you. It has nothing to do with you anymore. If the spirit of God is in you, you're spiritual. And get with the program is what he's saying. So you got to start living that way. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ... He is not his. If you don't have the Spirit of God living in you, you're not, you're not a Christian. You can go to church if you want to, in Bible study. You can raise your hands and go through the motion. But if you don't have the Spirit of God, then it's all for naught. And so you want to make sure, as 
we're taught to make your calling and election sure. Make sure of your own salvation. And, in verse 10, if Christ is in you, Christian, the body, or the old man, the Adam nature, is dead because of sin. But, remember we learned that, to reckon the old man dead. The old man is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Again, this again speaks of the two natures. The new nature, the old nature is dead, the new nature is in you, and so you now can live unto the Spirit. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies, mortal bodies is referring to our physical bodies now, through his Spirit who dwells in you. Now, some have said it's possible he's talking about the resurrection of the body. And that God is going to raise our bodies one day just as he raised Jesus' body. And there is a lot of debate as to, does that mean these bodies are going to be in heaven? Uh, Are we going to not care about these bodies? Are we getting new bodies? Paul seemed to indicate that we're going to, our bodies are going to change. I can tell you, I don't care. I just want to go to heaven. I don't care how I'm getting, I don't care if I have this body or not. I just hope it's in better shape when I get to heaven. But I want to have a body that's fine for heaven. This one I don't think is fashioned for heaven. That's my view. That's my opinion. No, I'm not talking about its shape. It's shaped perfectly as far as I'm concerned. (laughs) Pear is a shape. I think... (laughs) God help me. I, I, I think that our bodies will be different in heaven. They'll obviously be spiritual, glorified bodies, and I think that's what we're going to have to look forward to, hopefully. But, um, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to our, your mortal bodies, through his Spirit who dwells in you. So we're his possession. We are the temple of God, and so... He has every right to do what he wants with these bodies. And therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. You don't, you don't owe your flesh anything. You don't owe him anything. He's dead to you now. Remember, that's what he said in, in uh, chapter 7. Oh, once he's dead, well, he can't fulfill his agreement. His contract's over. And so we have to reckon him dead. He's dead. You owe him nothing. The debt has been canceled because he's dead. And so there's no uh, debt whatsoever. But you are alive in the Spirit. So if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body you will live. It, that's, that's the warfare again. You see that warfare that is there. That choice, the battle, the fight, the temptation to either follow the flesh or follow the spirit. But notice something it says, but if you choose to live by the spirit, then you must put to death the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of the body, or you will die. And uh, spiritually speaking, in other words, you you must do something. It is not something that just automatically happens. We have a responsibility to battle to fight, to say no to the flesh, yes to the spirit. That battle is is ongoing, ever-present, every day, every moment of every day, we are battling. And, uh, you know, a a lot of people will say, uh, you know, it's not easy being a Christian. Well, in many ways, that's true. It's not easy being a Christian because of this. When you're not a Christian, this battle isn't happening. It's just not there. You just do whatever comes naturally. Some have regrets, some don't. That's without Christ. Now you've got this new nature in you that's tempting you to godliness, luring you to holiness, and and constantly reminding you there's a better life. There's a better life. This life is not going to bring you happiness. And there is the evidence of it, the broken heart that you have, the, the, the misery that you experience because you didn't do, the, do it the Lord's way. And so there is now this, this dual consequence that you didn't have to deal with before. So it's, it's very painful. 
but it's now the spirit that's coaxing you to do something, put it to death, put an end to that, say no to it. It's time to quit that habit. It's time to put that behavior behind you. It's time you started talking differently to your wife. It's time you behave differently to your children. It's time for you to change. And that's the Spirit of God speaking to you. And sometimes, don't get me wrong, folks, sometimes God uses the gifts in the body like the gift of teaching through the gifted teachers, like tonight, who's acting as God's mouthpiece that says it's time to change. And for some of you, that comes as a word from the Lord. It's time to change. And so hear it and be ready to, to, to do what the Lord has been showing you to do. And what he's showing you to do is you have to put to death the deeds of the flesh or the body. For And here's the evidence of it. Here's why. In verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Now, he's not talking about salvation here. He's talking about evidence. This is the evidence. If you are following after the Spirit, well, you must be a child of God. If you're not following after the things of the Spirit, you're probably not a Christian at all. You just call yourself one. You just think yourself one. But if you have no inclination at all for spiritual things, I'd be worried or I'd get on my knees and repent and ask God to put his spirit inside of you because that is the evidence. And then you wake up from that prayer, you come, come out of your prayer life in that moment, and then you say, Holy Spirit, lead me. What would you have me to do? You remember when Paul got saved that first day when he met the Lord on the road to Damascus, the first thing he said was, Lord, what would you have me to do? Lead me. That's the, that's the whole premise of the phrase, Lord. You're, you're saying, I am your servant, so tell me what you want me to do. And that's the Spirit of God is what he wants to do. And the Spirit of God does not drive you. He doesn't whip you into submission. He doesn't, he doesn't force you to do what you do not want to do. So where's your mind? Is it on the flesh or is it on the Spirit? If it's on the Spirit, well, you're being led. If it's on the flesh, well, then you're being driven by the wrong things. That's The devil will drive you to your flesh, drive you to your flesh, and that's what he'll want you to do. But the Christian is led by the Spirit of God, and that is the evidence of sonship or being a child of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. I love that. The spirit of adoption. You're, you're not in bond, you were in bondage to the law, to sin, to the world, to the devil. All that was bondage. You had no choice in that matter. You were under bondage. But you didn't receive that when you came to Christ. You were given a place in God's house, a, a membership to his family. Family, it's not a matter of get out, I'm through with you. No, I, I'm stuck with you, I gotta live with you. You're my son, what can I do with you? It's, it's a different relationship altogether. And so we have not given this, we're not in this legal arrangement, we're children now. And that's why we cry out, Abba, Father. Now. I don't want you to think of those words as some sort of mystical voodoo. It's not that at all. It just simply means Papa. It's relationship is what it's talking about. And when we were in Israel, we were in this one square and all these little Jewish kids were playing and they were taking a break from school. Mom and dad, the teachers were all around there. And you hear all the kids running and saying, Abba, Abba, they were yelling to their daddy. Daddy, daddy, it's a relationship. Now, that's what God is saying to us here. We don't enter into this relationship with God by the law. That's what the legalist does. We better do this or else. No. We want to change. I've been talking about changing, and I'm saying, Christian, you have to change now because the Spirit of God is in you. But it's, it's because we're a different family member now. 
We belong to a new family. We belong to the family of God, and so now we want to represent his name. So we've got, to, we've got to be different people to represent his name, to live up to the calling of who we now are. We belong to God, and so we can now say he's our daddy. And that's Jesus taught us to pray that. Our Father, not Almighty God. He brought it down so that we can reach him. When you pray, say, Our Father, who art in heaven, but hallowed be thy name. It's, there's a tenderness there that he's teaching us about, and Paul is touching it here. We have the spirit of adoption, and now he's our daddy. And the spirit himself is telling us this. That's what he's saying. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so now it is a matter of the joyful experience of being a child rather than the legal uh, ramifications if we don't do the right things. And if we're the children, then we're heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So here we have the evidence of sonship is that we are people, children, led by the Father. We're led by God, led by the Spirit. Well, this tells us that we are the sons of God. Well, there's something else too, and that's persecution or, or suffering in this Christian life. In other words, suffering as Christians becomes a family trait because Jesus suffered. All of Jesus' people suffer. And it's natural to suffer because we are going against the flow of everything that is natural. Everything natural. We go against the flow of, of society. Society is going in one direction and we're saying, no, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't believe that. I don't buy that. I, I can't do that anymore. I used to do that, but I, I, don't, I don't go for that anymore. I was talking with one of our elders just this evening. And he was talking about a, a place where he works and you know, he's been working there for a few years and he was, he was saying how terrible this place is. It's just, oh, these people are rotten. They're just miserable. They're just on and on and on. And he's really complaining, you know, expressing a lot of complaint. And I told him, I says, you know, uh, they haven't changed. <laughs> You've changed. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that you start noticing those things because you realize how much you have changed because you used to be just like them. We all did, and suddenly something's happened. Yeah, you've taken on the name of the Father. You've taken on the name of Christ, and now you are Christian. And the Spirit of God is leading you, and so you start to suffer when you see society doing the things that it's doing in darkness where we used to live. You know, as they say, there's nothing worse than the smoker who's just quit. And all he does is, you know, start railing on people who smoke. You know, you really should quit that. Wait, weren't you smoking just last week? Yeah, yeah but I've quit. You know, you shouldn't be doing that. And, and then suddenly, you know, the, 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 anyway, you get the point. Well, that's how we become sometimes as Christians is that we start looking at the world and I can't believe they're, look at what they're doing. Did you forget what, what you did when you were not a Christian? And so we, we need to keep that in mind. Remember from where we have fallen in that sense. And uh, it's not only the world that we're fighting against, it's not only the world that we're suffering through, the society that we live in, but you know we do have a devil out there who is our enemy and he hates us. And you once were his prize subject. You once were his star pupil. Uh, he had high hopes for you in using you to destroy as many lives as he possibly could. And suddenly you got all religious on him and it, it freaked him out. And so now he wants to punish you for that. And so there's suffering there. And then there are people that we have to run into all the time. People who know you, know you and love you. Suddenly you're heading in a different direction and you're, you've got all this new language and, and you spend a lot of time reading this book known as the Bible. What a Jesus freak you are. And, and, then, and then they start teasing you about it. They, they start questioning you about it as if maybe you, you spend a little too much time with those, those Jesus people. Are you sure you're not in a cult? 
I mean, you could be doing other things, but you spend so much time down there. And why? Why would you do such a thing? And all of these things put pressure on you. And you start even questioning, yeah, what am I doing? Is it a cult? Is, it, is this real for me? Yes, it's real. What am I doing? <laughs> you start slapping yourself. Yes, of course it's real. But these are suffering things. And in some, some ways, it can get physical. And uh, so uh, we hope it doesn't in our world, but here he says these are the things we're going to suffer. Indeed, we suffer with him because we belong to him. We're his children. And so it becomes a family trait, but <laughs> that we may also be glorified together. So we have a family trait, but we also have a family home. And it's, it's like a summer getaway, only we never have to give, up, give it up. It, we never have to get away. We just go there, and that's where we're going to live. We're going to heaven. And that becomes our heaven, heavenly destiny. And we certainly cannot wait to get there. And I have to confess that something has happened that I was afraid was going to happen. And that is that I couldn't finish Romans chapter 8. And, and so we're going to have to pick up here at some point because it's so late. And I just so love this, this chapter so much. And... Have you been able to tell I'm really in love with the chapter? And I want you to love it too. So I, I think it's important to spend more time on it. So um, we'll finish this next week. What do you say? You up for it? Yep. All right. Lord, as, uh, we close these words now in this uh, pre predicament of a place. <laughs> oh, there's so much I want to keep going. And I wish I had three, four hours to teach on it, but we don't. And so we pray, God, that these words, this half of the chapter would have put us in a, in a mood to want more of it, and that we would want so much more. But Lord, what you spoke to us about tonight is so very important, that the Spirit of God lives inside of us, that there's no condemnation because of that, because we're in Christ and Christ is in us. It's so important. You taught us about walking in the Spirit of God. What a privilege, what power, what excitement. Oh God, help us to sense your spirit working in us and through us and, and that we could be led by you, not driven like cattle, but led like sheep. And we want to be led by you, Lord, because we're your children. We cry out, Abba, Father, we love you so much. We want to know you. We'll follow you even into trouble, into the sufferings that you experienced because we bear your name. We're yours, and we delight in that, Lord, how we love you. Please bless your children tonight, every one of us, as we would take these words to heart, that we would want to make you proud. You know, many of us spend so much time wanting to make our dads proud, our parents proud. Some of us don't have parents and wish we had parents to be proud of us, but we can do that with you. And we know that we can live our lives for you. And we want to do that, Lord. Help us to be led by your Spirit into those places of peace. Work on us where we must. Give us the courage to confess sin and allow you the permission to deal with it gently, remove it from our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace, your love. We have no reason to fear because perfect love casts out fear. We have no reason to be afraid of you. You're our Father, our Papa. We love you. So tonight, search our hearts, reveal to us what you want to do, and we will say amen, so be it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.